Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to our next podcast. And this is going to be on calcified pancreatic masses. What are they and why? And this was a brief talk I gave at the ISCT, and it's somewhat interesting. When we look at different signs of pancreatic lesions, we have noticed that calcifications are not uncommon, and the presence and appearance of calcifications can be very helpful at differential diagnosis. Now, when you think about pancreatic calcifications, in general, the most common cause of pancreatic calcifications is chronic pancreatitis. And that's usually pretty simple. The gland is small, perhaps, dilated pancreatic duct. Calcifications are diffuse, though usually more common in the pancreatic head. But there are multiple punctate calcifications, look like calculi. That's pretty easy. But when you get beyond pancreatitis, and again, typically it's chronic pancreatitis, calcifications can look different and can be very informative. The presence and appearance can be a guide to lesion detection. Now, when we did our app on pancreatic masses, we did have that question. Is your calcification present in the pancreas? If yes, then where is it located? Is there a pattern to the calcification? Is the mass cystic or solid or both? Is the mass hypervascular? And why we had those questions, well, a hypervascular lesion with calcification neuroendocrine tumor, cystic lesion with central calcification, serous cyst adenoma, uh, cystic lesion, rim calcification, under 3CM, IPMN. So we can be very, very helpful. Now, if you look at calcified pancreatic lesions, here's a nice list of non-neoplastic and neoplastic. You can see from the serous cyst adenomas to spen, metastasis, say renal cell, to many of the benign causes from pseudocysts to vascular calcifications and the like. So let's look at some of the possibilities. Now, when we think about pancreatic cancer or pancreatic neoplasms, we always think about adenocarcinoma, fourth leading cause of cancer deaths. It's the majority, 85% of all pancreatic neoplasms, with the majority located in the pancreatic head. The lesions, as we know, are typically hypovascular, obstruct common in pancreatic duct, and CT is very sensitive. Now, calcification is not something we think about. Actually, the most times I see calcification, it's that patients who've had chronic pancreatitis and then eventually develop cancer, that three to 5% of overlap of patients. And so the calcifications are not really the tumor, it's really the underlying chronic pancreatitis. But here's a good example of where the patient did have a mass in the head of the pancreas and this calcification. The calcification was probably from chronic pancreatitis. And on biopsy, this patient had an adenocarcinoma. So adenocarcinomas in and the, of themselves do not calcify. It's the fact that we see them more in patients with chronic pancreatitis that it appears to be within the gland. Sometimes the way I diagnose a carcinoma arising in a patient with chronic pancreatitis is displacement or movement of the calcifications compared to prior studies. Now, neuroendocrine tumors are something we're seeing more commonly now. We think about insulinomas and gastrinomas, which can cause uh, impressive hormonal syndromes. With neuroendocrine tumors, they're best seen typically on arterial phase imaging, usually isodense on venous phase imaging. CT sensitivity is well over 80%. The lesions can range in size from a few millimeters to tens or more centimeters. Calcifications are not uncommon, and the calcifications are often dystrophic. Other things with patients that are endocrine tumors, vascular liver metastasis, single, but more commonly multiple, uh, vessel involvement. But here's a nice example showing you calcifications in the head of the pancreas in one patient and calcification in the tail of the pancreas in the other. These patients both had neuroendocrine tumors. Again, what makes life very simple in terms of diagnosing these cases is neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas in most cases are hypervascular. So to me, a hypervascular mass, dystrophic looking calcifications, we're talking about pheochromocytoma as a likely possibility in making the diagnosis. And here's just a couple more images from that case. And here's another example just to show you that the calcifications can be very large or they can, in this case, be very small. When they're larger, it makes it easier, but even small, if you're uncertain, it can be helpful. Now, I have to admit a vascular lesion of the pancreas to me is a uh, neuroendocrine tumor, so it's not a great difficult diagnosis. 
Or here's another example of a, of a lesion with minimal calcification. You can see it probably better on the coronal view. Cystic and solid and hypervascular. That was again a neuroendocrine tumor in the head of the pancreas. Now sometimes if you can't tell if a lesion is duodenal or it's pancreas, maybe the calcifications can be helpful. Now a, a lesion we commonly associate with calcification is serous cystadenomas, usually an incidental finding in patients with a range of appearance. Polycystic is the most common, oligocystic is the least common, the cysts are usually under 2 cm, uh, usually in the head, but it can occur in the tail. You can have septations with a central scar not uncommon with coarse calcifications in 30% of cases. And here's just a very nice example. Large cystic lesion, central coarse calcifications, mass effect, typically no duct, duct obstruction, serous cystadenoma. Or this patient, dystrophic calcifications in the head, in one patient, in the body and tail in another. These are classic examples of serous cystadenoma. Again, those central calcifications are most helpful to me. Now, if I then say, what else calcifies? Well, spen tumors, solid pseudopapillopathial neoplasms. Very little has been said about that, but as we collected more and more cases, the calcification becomes a wonderful landmark. Up to 2% of exocrine pancreatic tumors are spen tumors, more common in younger women. Imaging uh, shows encapsulated solid masses, most commonly in the tail. You may see some enhancement, 30% calcification, peripheral calcification. And so one of the really cool features in my experience with spen tumors, cystic and solid mass with what appears to be eggshell calcification. That's almost a path pneumonic because if you think about it for a second, I told you serous cystadenoma is a central calcification. I told you neuroendocrine tumors are variable, but they're not in the periphery. Uh, spen tumors, again, it's a certain age group. You tell me a 20-year-old female with a pancreatic mass, I'm saying spen every time. But here's just a nice example. Large cystic and solid lesion. You can see some vascular involvement. You see the areas of calcification, particularly in the... Uh, periphery of the gland nicely shown on MIP imaging. And here's another example, 7.4 centimeter complex mass, cystic and solid, but look at that calcification. It's best described to me as eggshell calcification. This was a classic spent tumor, and it's not always like that. Here's more of a cystic and solid mass with dense central calcification. Could this have been a neuroendocrine tumor? Yes. Could this have been a serous cystadenoma? The answer is yes. So we're not always going to be specific, but it surely can be helpful. Now, I mentioned before IPMNs, which we see in 3 to 5% of patients, can occasionally calcify. I am seeing the calcification more commonly. It's typically in the periphery. It's kind of like an eggshell calcification, but only a small piece calcifies. Uh, these are tumors in older patients. They're not uncommon. The key thing is how you manage these patients. Under 3 cm, most people will watch. Under 3 cm, but growing, most people will either biopsy or remove those tumors. And again, calcification to me can be helpful. Here's one of the cases with denser calcifications. Most of the cases I have seen personally have peripheral rim-like calcifications. Now, another tumor to mention is MCN, mucinous cystic neoplasms. These are somewhat classic in terms of history. I said spin was younger females. These are middle-aged females, middle-aged being 54. Typically a cystic lesion in the tail or body-tail junction. Most of the time it's an incidental finding. These lesions will often have, as I'll show you in a moment, peripheral calcification. Uh, MCNs are kind of a challenging case. Uh, because of some of its features that it can become malignant. A small percent of cases usually related to size of the lesion as well as nodular components within the lesion. So it's just something, uh, here's a good example. Peripheral calcification, could this be an IPMN with calcification? Absolutely. I think the size, history, location push people to an MCN. Now I'll just mention pancreatic pseudocysts because we all know, and we spoke before about pancreatitis calcifying, not a surprise patients. 
uh, have pseudocyst postpancreatitis, and if the pseudocysts don't resolve, they can partially calcify. So in about 10% of cases of chronic pancreatitis, these pseudocysts can have calcification. Uh, in terms of how we use CT in that regard, obviously, we see many other findings of pancreatitis from the inflamed gland to any of the complications, but the mass effect, uh, which is commonly seen you may see some calcifications. And if you're uncertain what you're dealing with, this potentially at times can be helpful. So summarizing then, there are numerous etiologies for calcifications within or on the surface of the pancreatic gland. And a knowledge of these lesions can help you identify the calcifications and develop a well-constructed differential diagnosis list. And with that, I thank you for your attention.